But we'll go ahead and get started. Tonight's presentation, What's That Waiting Bird? We're going to wade through the vagarities of the waiting birds and how to tell them apart, a little bit about them, maybe some things that'll help remember their identities. I am with the UF IFAS Extension Services. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the Extension Services. Every county in Florida and the Seminole Nation have an extension of the University of Florida. We're probably best known for our gardening advice, but we also are very much committed to promoting natural resource conservation through education. So we educate our citizens on the importance of um, conserving what we have that's natural. And Pinellas County is unique and, well, has the dubious distinction of being the smallest county and yet the most highly densely populated. So our natural areas are very, very critical. And the, um, the preserve at Brooker Creek uh, by preserve standards is kind of small. We're 9,000 acres. Um, my boss's husband works for Swift Mud and he burns 9,000 acres a day in some of the preserves that are found throughout Florida to keep their ecosystems healthy. So Brooker Creek, very, very special place. And we invite you to visit our four miles of boardwalks and 50% um, freshwater wetland and 50% up up, upland, dry upland habitats. Uh, where you can certainly find wading birds around the marshes and creeks and swamps that we have at Burger Creek. So what's that wading bird? This evening we'll take you through a little bit of a overview of the wading birds. What I love about the wading birds and observing them is that you can do it from the car. You know, you don't have to get out and wear a whole bunch of gear and mosquito netting and, and everything else or go to an exotic location. Uh, Wading birds are larger birds, and they are pretty easily observed from a safe distance, from a respective, respectable distance. Uh, of course, binoculars are always a welcome accoutrement when you're observing wading birds. But what makes a wading bird? It's their adaptations to living in and around the water. Now, these birds don't swim to make their living, they walk. And so they have as a common um, characteristic long legs. And as you know, birds walk on their toes. They're what, what look like splay, a splayed out foot is actually toe bones. And their little ankle is what we see swollen just here. This is the ankle bone of a a uh, white egret or a great egret. So other adaptations are their uh, bills. So their beaks or bills that these birds use to capture their prey. And the different groups of wading birds have different beaks or bills in order to capture the prey that that particular species is most um, uh, adapted to consume, as it were. So here we have the great egret with its piercing stabbing bill that acts something like uh, a, a knife, as it were, uh, that has captured a small fish. Of course, the rosette spoonbill has a very differently shaped beak because its uh, feeding is very different. It's not a, a stabbing, piercing capturing type of predator. This one is more like a filter feeder and the way that the roseate spoonbill feeds is unique and it allows these different species to feed in the same area. So the wading birds are all adapted to feeding in the same place, wading around in marshes and freshwater and saltwater wetlands in the shallows without actually submerging for their prey. But since they have these different bills, they have different feeding methods, they have different prey species, and therefore they don't compete with each other and they can be found in huge aggregations. Another of our wading birds with a very different uh, feeding apparatus, the, the beak or the bill of the white ibis, very distinctive downward curve uh, is not shared by any other um, bird of this size or coloring that downward turned bill. Very, very distinctive. And this is a bird that specializes in crustaceans. 
that it's able to uh, probe for with that downward facing bill. So the different wading birds fall into some categories uh, with common names. And we all know the problem with common names is that they're not very common and they're not always as descriptive as we would like them to be. What we'll look at today are a group, are these groups, the, the bitterns, the egrets and herons, the ibis, and there are more than one, uh, the spoonbill, the stork, the limpkin, and we'll mention the flamingo because if you remember, recall our most recent unfortunate situation with a hurricane um, had the strange um, byproduct of bringing a whole bunch of, of flamingos into our state and even further north, as far north I think as Minnesota or something like that. So we did get an influx of a very distinctive wading bird, the flamingo. So we'll start with a group, a subgroup of the egrin, egrets and herons called the bitterns. And if you're not familiar with bitterns, you would certainly be forgiven. The bitterns are almost invisible. Uh, you will hear them before you see them, if you ever see them at all. These are masters of camouflage. And even though these are wading birds and they belong to groups of birds that are large and in charge and you know, command a presence as they wade around in shallow waters, these hide very, very well. And the American bittern and the least bittern, they both have a posture and a coloration that helps them to disappear into um, uh, marshlands, where especially where grass is predominant. So if you look at the American bittern on the left, you can see the stripes on his neck and those mimic the blades of grass just perfectly or the rushes or the cattails. So you can just see how that bird would blend in just perfectly. And even the least bittern, which is only about a quarter the size of the American bittern, the American bittern comes up to about maybe your hip and the least bitter maybe you know your your calf so a small much smaller bird but regardless they have this ability to disappear into the rushes and reeds of wetlands and they do this by kind of splaying their legs in opposite directions and holding on. This is a juvenile least bittern, and he's got hold of two rushes, and he's holding tight and absolutely invisible. In fact, um, here is the last thing that perhaps a bullfrog would see uh, before leaving this earth. It's the downward facing gaze of the American bittern. Now, the bittern, the American bittern is a migrant, and we only see these in the wintertime here in Pinellas County. They come and visit and wander around our grasslands and our uh, wet marshes. Another adaptation of the egrets and herons and, and several other of the wading birds is that even though birds have eyes on the sides of their head, which is true also of the, the wading birds, they're also slightly rotated forward. So they effectively act like binocular vision, like predators have, like the uh, the hawks and the eagles and the all the accipiters that have those forward facing predatory eyes. The um, the wading birds have their eyes on the sides of their heads, but they're still rotated slightly forward so they can have that forward vision when they're hunting. Now, here's a really good picture of a bittern. This is what you'll see. Do you see it? Of course not, you don't because they don't want you to. So this is how you can spot a bittern in the wild. Related to the bitterns, are this group, and the bitterns actually belong to this larger group, which are the herons and the egrets. And heron and egret are almost interchangeable words. Um, they are the same biological group of birds. The reason that one group or some individuals are referred to as herons versus egrets, we'll look at in just a second. Um, it would be great if we could maybe even get rid of egret altogether. We'll explain why in just a second. Our two largest, the great blue and the white, the great blue heron and the white egret are the largest of our wading birds, among the largest of our wading birds. And another little white is the snowy egret, little egretta 
Thula. And here in its breeding plumage is what nearly doomed the birds that are known as egrets. Because in the breeding season, they produce these feathers, which are called aigrettes or egrets. The feathers themselves are called the egrets, and they were used to adorn uh, various costuming, and it nearly wiped out the birds that are known as egrets. Those same that same plumage is produced in the great egret during breeding season, uh, where resources are plentiful. Um, birds don't necessarily have to fight for dominance over a particular area because resources are not a limiting factor. So instead, these birds produce extravagant displays because they don't need to defend a territory. They don't need to defend a harem of females um, with limited resources. They just need to be the prettiest. And here is a great egret in its breeding plumage, which we will be seeing in the coming weeks. We're already seeing signs on our waiting birds that they are going through this seasonal change uh, and getting new plumage, new, I almost want to say foliage. My background is in, in botany. So if I do accidentally refer to foliage, I haven't completely lost my mind. It's just the botany in me trying to, trying to squeak out a little bit. The aigrette, as I mentioned before, is a feather adornment, usually affixed to a hat or a military costume. And of course, in the early 20th century, um, entire colonies, entire breeding colonies of egrets were wiped out. They were the, their most vulnerable on and around their nests. And through various nefarious ways, humans would uh, collect breeding adults with their breeding plumage because they were so vulnerable trying to defend their nesting sites, which are very often small spoils islands or small islands um, in bodies of water where they naturally would be protected from predators. But humans, of course, being the ultimate predator, um, nothing can stop us. The great egret uh, is the large white bird. It's not the great white heron, it's the great egret. Unfortunately, again, with the common names, uh, it gets a little bit confusing. When these birds fly, they tuck in their necks. These birds have a special bone in their neck called the hyoid bone, and it's S shaped. We also have a hyoid bone in our necks. It's kind of free floating around our voice box, but in these birds, it's very sharply S shaped, and it allows these birds not only to tuck in their head when they're flying and be a little bit more aerodynamic, but it's also the mechanism that allows them a, a trigger-like response to uh, uh, catching and attacking their prey with their dagger-like beak. So in flight, you can see the great egret with its neck tucked in. Here's a great shot of a great egret uh, with that S-shaped hyoid bone making an appearance, allowing it to curve its neck into that sigmoid shape. The great egret compared to a duck, just about everybody knows how big a duck is. So the great egret compared to a duck, an idea of its size, again, about a meter, meter and a half tall with its black, black legs and black feet. That's something to take note of. When nesting is happening, it is done communally. There is safety in numbers and these birds will nest in trees and the trees can be over water or just near to water. So uh, there's a really, um, healthy breeding population of great egrets at one of our theme parks here in Tampa Bay called Bush Gardens. And the 
sound and the community of all the exotic birds somehow appeals to the great egrets and signals to them that things are good. The noises that the other birds are making as they're feeding, they sound happy, they don't sound threatened, and it causes it uh, results in this kind of safety zone for the great egrets to nest as well. And they're not too close to a large area of fresh or salt water either. And it is worth mentioning that these birds are at home both in salt and fresh water. Some species might prefer a little to the other, but as a whole, the wading birds can be found in salt water on the shores of salt water or the shores of fresh water as well. They're not too picky about that. It's also important to note that when the young of the egrets and herons are on the nest, they will stay there until they are almost fully grown. So in that way, even though they are alert and awake and you know alive and kicking and flapping their tiny little wings when they're in the nest, um, like a precocial species, they do not leave the nest until they are fully fully fledged. So in that respect, they are more um, altricial, as it were. So you will never see a great egret walking around with baby egrets in tow. Oftentimes when masses of waders are together and folks see a large great egret and perhaps a snowy egret in the same vignette, they might assume that the, the snowy egret is just a baby great egret. So when the, but it, the fact is when the, when the egrets come off the nest, they're going to be the same size as the adults. They don't follow their parents around. They're, they don't leave the nest until they're ready to forage on their own fully grown. The snowy egret is the tiny one that could be easily mistaken for a baby great egret, but isn't. Uh, a great way to recognize the snowy egret is a slightly obscene little uh, thought gong. Um, you've probably heard of yellow snow. Well, the snowy egret has yellow feet and those yellow feet are very, very obvious when they're walking, when they're waiting. If you have sight of the feet, you see yellow feet, you know you've got yellow snow, you've got the snowy egret. And when the snowy egret is flying and they have their legs extended, which is another feature of the egrets and herons, they have their legs extended in flight, you can see those yellow feet as well. Their beak, on the other hand, is black. The great egret's beak is yellow. So there's a little bit of an opposites there, but yellow feet, think of the um, the yellow feet walking through the yellow snow, and you might be able to remember the snowy egret is that of the two. The snowy egret is about the size of a duck, fully grown. Um, this one is about coming into breeding plumage. So this is not only fully grown, but it's a breeding aged adult. They reach breeding age at about one or one and a half years. So great, um, Great strides has been made in the conservation of these species, and some with more rapid reproductive rates have certainly done better than those species that take a little bit longer to mature. Here are the snowy egret in flight. Again, uh, typical of the family, he's got his head tucked in using that hyoid bone, and you can still see those yellow slippers that this snowy egret wears. And they, I meant to mention earlier as well, during breeding season, the skin around the eyes of the egrets very often will change color and become very, very bright and very, very distinctive. So the snowy egret, it actually will turn from yellow to red. And in the great egret, that skin around the eye, it's called the lore. Uh, L-O-R-E, just like a, a story, uh, the lores will, plural, will turn a bright, bright green in the great egret. So green, great, that might be another way to remember those. Our rarest of the egrets, uh, the one that had the, is still having the most trouble in re uh, rebounding from the feather trade is the reddish egret. 
Uh, this one was hunted nearly to extinction. And for whatever reason, either it's a reproductive rate or a preference for habitat at reproduction time, uh, the reddish egret is still listed as an endangered species. And its rookeries are still kept very, very secret um, just to get, because there are still threats to the survival of this species through collection or um, um, perturbation, I want to say, molestation, just, uh, you know, um, people that want to get a close-up look or, or get a great photograph might disturb these birds off their nest, and that could put them back another year. But the reddish egret is a very, very charismatic egret. It's one of the larger egrets. It's larger than the snowy, not quite as big as the grape, and it does have a reddish hue to its feathers, especially the feathers on its head and neck. What's most distinctive about the reddish egret is the way that it dances. If you ever were to see a group of wading birds and one of them is just going off, jumping around, flapping its wings, leaping back and forth, pirouetting, doing all these crazy movements, it's very likely a reddish egret. They dance around in the shallow water, ostensibly to scare fish into a frenzy, uh, get them confused, get them swirled, get them out of a, a ball of fish so that then they're isolated. And then the reddish egret can use that dagger-like bill to pick off maybe a slower swimming member. A little bit of photographic um, liberties taken here with the setting sun, uh, really giving uh, an idea of where the name comes from for the reddish egret, the, the kind of russet colored feathers of the head and neck accented by the, the setting sun in this photograph. But again, being an egret of the heron and egret complex in flight, this bird tucks, it, tucks its head in and has its legs sticking out the back. No yellow feet for the reddish egret. The reddish egret has that distinctive coloration and the behaviors if you see it feeding. Anyone wanna guess what this one is? Cattle egret maybe? Here it is doing what it says on the label, hanging out with the cattle. This is a bird that is native to Africa and grew up, evolved, kind of away from the water, kind of found out that if it followed herds of grazing animals, those grazing animals would kick up enough protein in the form of insects to make a living worth having. So just following a, a very harmless herd of grazers, the cattle egret makes a fantastic living um, without extending much effort, hardly at all. Just has to walk behind the grazing animals and pick the insects up as they get chased up by the grazing animals. Now, how did the cattle egret get to North America? It came on its own. Uh, that is known. What is not known is the mechanism or the incentive or um, just exactly when this happened but they are only known to be originated in Africa and perhaps they rode an, um, an east-west storm. They may have rode on one or more occasions a raft of vegetation that floated from Africa um, or just managed to fly. But once they established themselves in North America, they have become quite naturalized and they can be found wherever there are cattle or larger grazers. They will also make a very good living hanging out by the water. They've never forgotten that in their genetic makeup. So you will also see a cattle egret hanging out by the water away from the um, grazing herds. A distinctive characteristic of the cattle egret are its russet colored cap and breastplate. So a smallish egret, with a brown cap and breastplate is very likely a cattle egret. And they will be found in small flocks as well. Some of our other wading birds might be more solitary. The cattle egrets 
uh, having grown up in these foraging flocks, they tend to stick together. And where you find one cow egret, there's very likely a few more. Here's a good face shot of a cattle egret carrying some nesting material, looking a little bit disturbed by the photographer, has his crest raised, but it does show those russet colored um, uh, crown and breast feathers. Now, those are the egrets. Those are the animals that are called egrets because of the fact that they produce feathers that were used uh, to especially those species that were used for their feathers that were then used to adorn some sort of an outfit back in the day. The herons, it's worth mentioning, it's not that they don't produce these feathers, it's just those animals that were more likely used in the trade were referred to more as the egrets. And the herons are this very, very similar, very closely related in the same family um, of birds, the herons. And the great blue heron is probably our spokes heron. Everyone has seen or is aware of the great blue heron. The great blue heron makes a wonderful um, motif for um, souvenirs because of its majestic stature, its large size, and its beautiful coloration. Now compared to a duck, here is a very um, heated discussion between a great blue heron and, and a little mallard or malloid duck. Um, don't quite know what the problem could be here, but someone's someone's doing the wrong thing. But you get gives you an idea of the size difference between the great blue heron and a standard sized duck. Again, in flight, the great blue heron is going to have that signature silhouette. Identifying these birds at dusk can be quite difficult because when they fly around to roost at night, they're all going to have the same silhouette. You would have to be very, very, very sure of your size differences and your ability to gauge the size of a bird in flight uh, to be able to tell these birds apart if you didn't have the benefit of full sun on the uh, feather colors of these various wading birds. The great blue heron gets its name because of the kind of slaty blue gray color of the feathers. It does kind of read grayish blue um, when you see a bird standing. It's not a solid color as you can see here. Uh, the primary feathers, those primary flight feathers are much darker than the wing than the wing feathers that are uh, produced along the arms and shoulders as it were. Its cap is a darker color and it has a white chin and a mottled white neck, similar to the tricolored heron, but this bird is certainly much bigger than the tricolored heron. Here you can see the tricolored heron with its slaty blue gray being one of the colors, that white chin and the stripe along the neck like the great blue. The third color in the tricolor is this rust color. Um, you're more likely to see this bird exhibiting the blue and white effect. So the white belly and the white striped neck are the identifiers for the tricolor heron. If you're lucky to see this bird in its breeding plumage, uh, when it's at its absolute finest, you will get a good idea of the three colors. But for most of the year, the tricolor heron is a slaty blue with that white stripe along the neck. It really does look like a miniature great blue heron, but it is not. It is not a young great blue heron. It is not a baby great blue heron. This is the fully grown uh, tricolored, also called Louisiana heron. Those are the same species. Tricolored and Louisiana are the same. Um, and in breeding plumage, you can see here, it's got all kind of adornment. The lores on this bird turn blue, uh, right around the eyes and nostrils, the tip of the beak, a very shiny black. You can see the white stripe along the neck, very distinctive. And you can probably make out that this bird has a white belly from this photograph. Also with a little bit of plumage on the top of the head, a little top knot, and some longer plumage across the back. Uh, those 
Those represent the breeding plumages that allow the more showy birds to have more success at getting married. Here's a tricolored heron uh, feeding, and I've got the animated arrow pointing to that white stripe along the neck. That's what I always look for when I'm zooming past a, a retention pond at, you know, 35 miles an hour. If I see a heron walking that has that uh, white stripe along the neck, I know that that's a tricolor. And these are not as prevalent as the great egret or the little blue who we'll meet next. This bird is actually exhibiting a characteristic of these wading birds. Many birds have a second eyelid, a nictitating membrane is the fancy college word for that, that they can draw across their eyes and yet still be able to see. So it's a protective membrane that is transparent. It allows the bird to see while it is throwing its head face first into the water where its eyes could become damaged if not for that protective layer. So the slightly cloudy look to this bird's eyes is because it's got that second eyelid pulled across its vulnerable eye as it's fishing for prey in the water. When the bird is hunting, it's going to elongate its neck so it can get a literal bird's eye view of what it's looking for. The tricolor heron will also dance around a bit, will use its feet to scare up uh, prey species, but nothing, it's not the same size, and it's certainly not as exuberant as the reddish egret when it's doing its uh, feeding dance, as it were. And in flight, that neck stripe is very, very obvious. So if you see this bird flying by with a white belly and a white stripe against a darker colored background, you know you're seeing a tricolored heron. And be glad, again, because these birds are not as prevalent. They are also having trouble rebounding, you know, a hundred years after the massacre of the feather trade easily and forgivably mistaken for the tricolor. Uh, same size, same habits, same feeding mechanisms, um, same resource partitioning uh, is the little blue heron. It's called the little blue heron because it's little and it's blue. It's smaller than the great blue and it is all over the same color. So the little blue heron does not have the white belly does not have a white stripe on the neck. It is one uniform slaty blue color. Even its beak and the lores, except for the very tip, turn this slaty blue color, giving it its name, the little blue. And so the little blue, very distinctive. Once you perhaps see a little blue standing next to a tricolor, you would be able to be uh, see the similarities and see also the differences and help yourself figure out how you would tell those two apart if they didn't have the benefit of being stood next to one another. The little blue does something that nature is always up to. It does this. The little blue heron, when it's young, is fully clothed in white feathers. And I apologize, although it's not my fault, this is how it is. A little blue heron juvenile is a white plumaged bird and it will spend its first year with white plumage. How do you tell this from a snowy egret? Maybe look at the feet, right? And if you recall, the snowy egret had a solid black bill. The little blue juvenile is going to have that two-tone where it's slaty or gray around the lores and nostrils and black at the tip. Another thing about juvenile little blue herons, they have blue-green legs. So those factors together somehow maybe make a post-it note and put it on the cereal cabinet door you know, how to tell little blue from snowy egret. Uh, the little blue is a smaller egret, but when it's a juvenile, it's white. It gets worse. I'm, I, I hate to tell you, but it gets a little bit worse because there is a transitionary phase 
between the juvenile and the adult plumage. So at some point when the juvenile is growing up and putting on its adult colors, we have this creature. This is the little blue heron, same species, in that transitionary period where it is referred to as being pied, P-I-E-D, like the Pied Piper who wore black and white checkers um, as he led the rats out of town, or that's what he was supposed to be doing. Anyway, the Pied form is just a transitionary form between the juvenile white and the adult slaty gray. You still have the grayish lores and the black tip to the beak, and you still have the blue-green or greenish colored legs and no yellow slippers with the little blue. Hey, James. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, it's Kim. Hey. I don't mean, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, Kate had a quick question. Okay. Is the, is the little blue less grayish than the great blue heron? No, the little blue is actually slightly bluer. If you see a breeding little blue, it really is much more convincingly blue than the great blue. If you see one in real life, if you see a, a great blue, a painting of a great blue, they're going to really push on the blue. But in my opinion, the little blue reads, reads, as it were, when you're watching this thing, you know, from 35 miles an hour going past a retention pond, it's going to look bluer, bluer. Well, thanks, James. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no worries. Interrupt any time. Okay. Uh, we have two of these night herons. Um, they're not in the same genus, but they have the same modus operandi. They are crepuscular and nocturnal species of heron. And they tend to sit very, very still. They think they believe, they intend to be invisible when they are sitting along the banks of a wetland or over a wetland in a uh, old tree or something like that. They will sit stock still. They are lie in wait predators. They do not jump out and catch things. They wait for things to come by. And they do this um, at dawn and dusk. That is a crepuscular habit, being active at dawn and dusk. They have very large eyes that allow them to see better in the failing sunlight. Um, it is also said that the red coloration of their eyes is somehow beneficial in, uh, um, in receiving those longer wavelengths of light that are more prevalent at dawn and at dusk. So very distinctive. Um, so being able to identify a night heron is quite easy. They have a much, much heavier, heavier broader, thicker bill than in any of the other herons. And they sit all tucked up like the black crown night heron on the left. Where we run into trouble and of course, we have this whole presentation because the waiting birds can cause trouble. Uh, where we run into trouble is how to tell the difference between the two. They cut a very similar silhouette. They're both active at dawn and dusk. But how do you tell these two apart? It's kind of read the label. Uh, the black crown night heron has got that black crown. And the yellow crown night heron has something very close to a yellow crown. I think it's much more like a white crown, but regardless, it's not a black crown. Otherwise, these birds have, you can see for yourself, the obvious differences, the black crown night heron with the black back and the yellow crown night heron with a more of a mottled appearance, a, gr a gray background with black highlighting, the white breast of the black crown night heron, uh, and these two will also kind of differentiate in the types of habitats where they live. They're both crab enthusiasts. They're both crustacean enthusiasts. But the black crown night heron is more likely to be found around freshwater, looking for crayfish. Uh, they will also not turn down the meal of a frog. 
which of course are going to be found in freshwater environments. They will both eat fish quite happily, uh, but the yellow crown night heron is more likely to be found in marine environments where crab is its number one um, uh, dietary choice. So they have these heavy bills for crushing the exoskeletons of crabs uh, and other crustaceans. And they have those distinctive um, head ornamentation. Their curveball comes when they are juvenile. So the juveniles of both these species are brown with kind of tan colored modeling, which is a perfect uh, camouflage for sitting on a nest and being invisible. So their coloration is very cryptic. The browns and tans of dead vegetation that their nests are made of. And these birds, just like the others, are going to be fully grown before they leave the nest. Uh, so these you will find in their juvenile plumage away from the nest. So as soon as they are large enough to forage on their own, they will leave the nest fully grown, but in their juvenile plumage. I did it, I didn't say foliage. Um, the juvenile black crowned night heron has got a yellow bill and a juvenile yellow crowned has a black bill. Again, Apologies, not times two. Again, it's not my fault. Maybe that can help you tell the two apart if it's even that important. Sometimes just knowing that it's a juvenile night heron would be good enough. You can still see the short, stocky, heavy beak and the very large eyeball with that red tinge. These could be mistaken for a limpkin, but that beak, that very, very short, heavy beak should be your giveaway in identifying them. At night, again, that silhouette is very, very distinctive of the night heron. You can see the, 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 the shortened, thickened beak of the night heron. I don't know which one this is. It doesn't matter. We just know that it's a night heron at night. How about that? A tiny little green heron. If you haven't seen a green heron, it is a real treat. These are also kind of lie in wait predators. So these little green herons will sit with their neck tucked in, trying to be as small and insignificant as possible, um, cryptically colored with greens and blues in their feathers, uh, their, their uh, back and wing feathers. Um, their tucked nature is very distinctive in identifying this one. It has the exuberant coloration of the tricolor, but it is a much smaller, it's only about a third the size of a tricolored heron. Um, also, will sit and wait until something happens by. Here you can see the size of this compared to a frog. So that gives you an idea of the size of the little green heron. I even call it the little green heron. That's just a habit that I picked up. So perhaps you'd like to pick up that, that habit as well. When you're referring to the green heron, it's the little green heron and it kind of hides around in fresh and salt water environments. I've seen them oftentimes in marinas uh, looking for handouts um, and in freshwater ecosystems looking for frogs and in saltwater systems up in the mangroves where they can kind of hide and wait for something to come along. So again, they sit distinctively with their head tucked in like the night herons do. They don't stand around like the other herons and egrets with their neck outstretched, but they will when they're upset and they will make the noise of the herons and egrets, which if you've never heard the herons and the egrets when they're kicking off, they are not songbirds. They make a guttural rattling sound that sounds very, very dinosaur. They do not have a song, but they do have a voice and they use their voice when they are upset. And you will hear a green heron before you see it if it decides to, that you are too close or if there's something not to its liking. So those are the herons and the egrets, very interchangeable. 
very similar because they're in the same family of birds, but I hope you got a good idea of some of the similarities and differences that can help you give you a little bit of confidence when you approach them, even if it's only from the car. Uh, looking for some of these field characters that can help you identify the differences between a few of those. And we'll move on to another group of birds that includes the ibis, and the spoonbill. And these birds, these two birds, are very closely related. Thankfully, when they're adults, they have wildly different beak structures. Uh, but when they're juveniles, when they're on the nest, you can hardly tell the two apart. When they first hatch, you wouldn't know an ibis from a spoonbill. But thankfully, when they grow up, they do. But ibis, very distinctive, about the size of a tricolored heron, or a tricolored heron is about the size of an ibis. Here they are having some sort of discussion. Uh, their resource partitioning isn't going quite as smoothly as it's supposed to go. Uh, both being wading birds, both walking through the shallows, looking for crustaceans, looking for insects, looking for um, marine or, or freshwater invertebrates, worms, you name it, if it's got protein, it's on their diet, for sure. In flight, and you often see ibis in flocks, flocks of about a dozen, sometimes more, but usually about a dozen birds. And in flight, the ibis has distinctive black wing tips. So the white ibis with black wing tips, and that's not unique to the ibis, Many birds with white plumage, especially, will have black pigment on the tips of the primary flight feathers to strengthen those feathers. The black pigment is actually a um, fortifying pigment. So the presence of the black pigment actually makes those feathers stronger and less likely to get worn out because, of course, the primary flight feathers are going to take the brunt of the turbulence uh, when these animals are flapping through the air. So these have these black wing tips that are distinctive. You can see this when they fly or when they soar, um, and it's there to strengthen the, um, the feathers. This, I guess, is apology number three or four of many. I can't apologize enough for the fact that these birds, when they're juvenile, they pretend to be something else. And here we have on the left a juvenile white ibis not being white, instead being a mottled brown color. And again, just like the night herons, to which they are not related, but they have the similar adaptation to growing up on a nest, the juvenile ibis is cryptically colored until it leaves the nest fully grown and molts into its white plumage. But this in-between stage, you get a brownish, whitish um, individual, but that downturned beak is extremely distinctive. If you're lucky, Perhaps you've seen glossy ibis. It's our other ibis. There is a scarlet ibis of the Caribbean, but another of our native ibis is the glossy ibis. And it could be mistaken for a juvenile white ibis, but for the fact that it is a solidly dark color, there's no modeling of white, and that glossy iridescence is down to the architecture of the individual feathers, reflecting sunlight like prisms. The architecture of the individual fellow feathers um, catching and reflecting sunlight into these wonderful iridescent colors. So the glossy ibis is expanding its range and can now be found in parts of Florida where it hadn't been seen before. Um, I'm not sure, perhaps someone would like to let me know if Glossy Ibis is established around Jacksonville. I know that Pinellas County, um, this animal was extirpated, was chased out, and it's beginning to make a comeback. And we're very, very glad to see the return of the Glossy Ibis, not only because it's a conservation success, but also for those of us who just like to look at birds, it's something new to see. 
it's relative the pink bird everyone loves the pink bird what would we do without the pink bird everyone mistakes this one of course for the flamingo but how could you tell anything that has a face like a rosette spoonbill on unrivaled for strangeness in our waiting birds with that spoon bill that it uses to filter feed its resource partitioning belongs only to it it can filter um, sand and muck and soil uh, and mud uh, using its extremely sensitive bill uh, and its very active tongue to sort what is living and nutritious versus what is organic material that can be spit out. And they do this by rubbing it back and forth, uh, rubbing their bill itself back and forth uh, with itself, the upper and lower plates, and then waving its head back and forth through the water. Absolutely magnificent bird. And unlike the herons and the egrets, does not tuck its neck in flight. So this is a bird that even if you were curious as to whether or not you're looking at an egret or a spoonbill, if you couldn't tell the color with that neck extended and with that distinctive um, spoon shaped beak, uh, it pretty, pretty unmistakable. And here a good picture of that bird moving its beak through the water. Um, again, these don't swim, they wade, giving them their name, the wading birds. Here's a lineup. We can see on the left, the great egret with its black feet and yellow bill, the very distinctive and unmistakable spoon bill with its pink plumage and its spoon shaped face. And with it is one of our, we're coming up to the end, uh, one of our last wading birds, the limpkin. And limpkin is a wading bird that could be very easily mistaken for a juvenile night heron. It could be mistaken for a juvenile ibis. The difference here is that this animal makes a sound like none other. The limpkin makes a screaming, squawking sound. If you're familiar with the Tarzan movies of the 1950s and 60s, those were filmed in Florida, and you can actually hear Limpkin in the background making a cacophony of this racket. Uh, we get phone calls at our extension service. People are afraid that there's something terrible happening to a person when they hear these birds kicking off. Um, the Limpkin, a wading bird that specializes only in snails, and other mollusks. So snails and clams are the only thing that limpkin eats. Limpkin is about the size of an osprey. Here's a good um, comparison. And limpkin will spend most of its time in fresh water now, even though there are snails and mollusks available in salt water, and they will go to salt water, limpkin now is found primarily around lakes and retention ponds because of the introduction of some freshwater mollusks that have exploded in their populations and provided a huge resource for the limpkin. So here's the conservation conundrum. We have invasive species of um, mussel and invasive species of snail that are uh, a direct benefit to the population explosion of an otherwise endangered species. So what do you, where do you put that? Limpkin specializes in these mussels and mollusks. Limpkin is not related to anything else. Uh, it has a slightly downturned bill like an ibis. So again, you would be forgiven to maybe until you get plenty of good practice uh, mistaking a limpkin for a juvenile ibis. Uh, but limpkin is solitary, whereas remember the ibis tend to hang out in, in groups. Um, limpkin, the, the bill is used to excavate mussels from their shells, so it is asymmetrical. If you're fortunate enough to have a good enough pair of binoculars to be able to see that their beak actually kind of acts like a wedge to open the, the mussel or the snail. 
There's nothing in the world cuter than a baby limpkin, which could be distinctive. And these will leave the nest when they are small. So you will see a parent and an offspring limpkin. You will not see a size difference between the ibis. When the ibis juvenile leaves the nest, it is the same size as the parent. So you will see a limpkin uh, giving sustenance to its precocial young, the baby limpkin. I'm sure all of you agree that there's nothing cuter than a baby limpkin. And we'll end up with the wood stork. Uh, again, the wood stork is only our only stork. Uh, storks are actually on the same branch of the tree of the family tree of birds. They hang out with the uh, black vultures and the turkey vultures. So they have more turkey vulture adaptations like a bare head. Um, they are a face that only a bird lover or a bird parent could love, perhaps. Um, absolutely gross. They, they're scaly heads, no feathers, but they do the job. The wood stork out there on its own. It's our only North American stork. There's plenty of storks in Africa and, and Europe, but this is our only North American stork. The stork has the fastest movement by any animal. So faster than the beating wings of a hummingbird, uh, faster than a cheetah running across the plain. Uh, when this animal forages for food, it places its beak in the water and holds it kind of still. When something brushes against its tongue or against its very, very sensitive beak, the motion of the beak snapping shut is faster than any other animal movement of any animal on earth. So there's our distinctive fact of one of our ugliest wading birds. Huge, heavy beak, uh, again, no feathers on the head, the size of a great egret, uh, but in flight, very, very distinctive in having, again, the that black pigment to strengthen the primary and the secondary flight feathers, extended neck, uh, and a huge, huge, proportionally gigantic bill with its feet extended out. You'll see these uh, soaring in kettles along with the vultures to whom they are related and with other uh, birds of prey and the vultures uh, as they ride a kettle, they will spiral upward in the kettle and then sail to get a lot of distance without having to flap their wings very much. Here we have a group of these preacher birds as they're also known. You can see how they've got their mouths open and anything, anything that manages to brush up against their beak are going to not survive the, the snapping shut of the wood stork. Here we have a huge collection of wading birds. Can you see any that you recognize after today's brief presentation? I see. I see a great blue. I see a great egret. I see pink birds. I see great. I see also, so this is the kind of collection that you can see during a tidal event when the tide is going out or just before the tide comes in and all the fish are kind of trapped in the shallows. You'll see great, great conglomerations of these birds giving you the ability to hopefully tell the difference between the two. And now it's time for a quiz. Are you ready? All right. What is that waiter? Which one is this? I see yellow feet. I wonder what yellow feet means with a... Snowy egret. There's a snowy egret. How about one that hangs out with cows? That's the cattle egret. Sorry, how about one that's solid blue and kind of little? Yeah. Blue hair. Blue, blue, very good. And we have bigger than a duck and all white. Great egret. <laughs> Yellow bell and black feet. We got the great egret, well done. And the dynamic and majestic slaty blue. blue gray, great blue, very good. And with the downturned beak and the all white feathers, 
can only be the white ibis. Very good. Good job, you guys. All give yourselves a hand. Appreciate the attention tonight. Appreciate the invitation to present to you all. I thank you and invite you all to come and see us at Brooker Creek Preserve. You can join our Facebook page. That's probably the best way to get information about Brooker Creek Preserve. I am a public servant, so you are free to send me questions, comments, complaints, rebuttals at any time. My first initial and last name at Pinellas.gov. I'm going to open up the chat and see if we have any questions or comments that anyone has anything. I see we put some answers to some quiz. I think that's great. Cataly Grit is the little blue less grayish. We, I think we got to that one. Uh, do all herons have nictitating membranes? Yes. In fact, most birds writ large have nictitating membranes. I don't know why the primates don't. We could certainly use one. Many, many animals, reptiles, uh, to which, of course, birds are part of the bigger group of reptiles, have that nictitating membrane. I call the white ibis bug patrol in my lawn. Yep, they're very good. We call them sewing machine birds because of the way that they poke holes into the soil as they probe for grubs. Very good. Uh, does the spoonbill have a bald head? Yes, the spoonbill does have a bald head. Their head is bereft of any feathers. Has anyone seen? Okay, has seen glossy ibis in Jacksonville. That's great to know. Very great. Appreciate the questions and the comments. Uh, any other questions or comments before we hand it over? I had a quick question about yes. the reddish egret. I've never seen anything like that. Where... Uh, where are those found? Well, the populations are very, very small. Pinellas County would be a great place to come to oh, visit okay. the reddish egrets. We have resident populations that can be visited at Fort DeSoto Park and on the Dunedin Causeway. You can go and there's actually a rookery on the Dunedin Causeway that was almost turned into a um, sailboat marina. Um, but Thank, because of the reddish egret, that project was halted, so. Good. I know I've seen reddish egrets at Spoonbill occasionally. Has anybody else seen them out there? Yeah, in Huguenot Park as well. Oh, Huguenot, okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. They're not very common. Gotcha. They are struggling to come back very, very much. There is a father and son on uh, at Spoonville Pond that can be seen very rarely. Oh, cool. Great to know. It's good to hear about the glossies and the and the reddish in your area. Very good. Someone that was, asked. That was probably the most informative uh, wading bird presentation I've ever seen. Oh, great. Really Really it certainly was not exhaustive. Of course, there's more. Of course, we could get into all the shorebirds, but that would take hours and hours and hours. I hope that was a good uh, kind of preview to some of the more common birds that you're likely to encounter. Yes, yeah, there's a couple more so questions coming in. Someone asked, uh, who took the great photos? Oh, I, I wish I could get paid um, to to promote a lot of the photographs came from Canva, okay. which if, you, if you're not familiar, it's a presentation production platform uh, that is full of copyright free uh, images. And it has been an absolute godsend in production uh, of presentations because oftentimes the images are the limiting factor and uh, people have donated their photographs uh, to Canva to allow those of us who don't have that talent uh, access to those photographs, so. Oh, great. Any other questions? The one thing I'll add, James, I didn't know that the black winged tips strengthen their feathers. That was a new bit of info for me. Yeah, that black, yeah, the black pigment is actually a strengthening, um, and you'll see uh, when they do go to molt, um, 
the that black the black tips of the ibis feathers you know when they're when they're sitting in, in large groups and they're preening and maybe one of their flight feathers comes out you'll see just how weathered and worn they can be but the structure they're very very stiff still so you can actually so, witness it in your own hand james you made a comment about the uh yellow crowned night heron being mostly a marine species and What's interesting is at our Crosby Sanctuary, which is freshwater, we've been having them every year. They come in around April and they stay through most of the summer and then they go somewhere else after that. So I think they're coming to breed in our forested swamp preserve and then, you know, going somewhere else outside of the breeding season. So it's kind of interesting that they're there in a freshwater wetland. Well, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because I have to say I was very, very surprised when I took a trip to Austin, Texas. And a friend who I was staying with was having a terrible time with this bird that was making a mess in her backyard. And it was a nest of it was several nests of yellow crowned night herons all the way in Austin, Texas. So I'm not, I, I could never say that they're exclusive to saltwater, but at least in, in our area where we've got such ready access to, to freshwater and saltwater in the same little peninsula, um, they, they tend to partition themselves. Yeah, I was quite surprised to see them in Austin. I see Kate just asked, don't their night herons nest at the alligator farm? Does anybody know? Hmm. I know there's a lot of water birds that do nest at the alligator farm. I wouldn't be surprised. I've seen night herons now, not recently, but I, several years ago at the zoo. It seems like they were kind of all over the place for a while. I don't know if anybody's been out there lately. Um, Yeah, I don't know. What a great place to nest in an alligator farm. <laughs> we Talk have about lots of safe. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. the reason. They know. Just, yeah. just watch your step, that's all. <laughs> don't go down. <laughs> yeah. I think it would. Stay up yeah. in the tree. Yeah. James, this was great. I think you should well, add a, a Limpkin audio soundbite uh, here presentation yeah yeah because i'm it's gonna have to go look something. that up next. it's really really quite something well cool. well thank you i'm going to stop share and give it back to the hosts i appreciate your attention and i look forward to seeing lots of you at brooker creek when you do come do say come do come and say hello okay